Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with our 10 best, conductor's 10 best, that is special. And today, the preview, this is the preview, is about Fritz Reiner, the legendary conductor of the Chicago Symphony, who was only there for a decade, but who in that period managed to establish a standard that has become known, rightly so, as the golden age of the Chicago Symphony. He was quite the guy. But I would really, really, really like to examine the, in, the interesting phenomenon of the conductor autocrat. Because if anybody was an autocrat, it was Fritz Reiner. He was a tough guy. He was brutal. He was personally miserable. He terrorized his musicians. And, you know, in a way that could never happen today. It really couldn't. I mean, because the musicians, you know, realizing what they were up against, took measures to protect themselves. So now we have unions. Now we have blind auditions. Conductors can't just fire people and get rid of them. You just can't do it anymore. But back in those days, there was a whole raft of them, and you know who they were. Names like Toscanini, and Zell, and Reiner, and even Ormandy, and some of these other people. Herbert von Karajan, and initially in, in Europe, people who were known as tyrannical and, and artistically megalomaniacal, and people who really were totally controlling. I mean, nowadays, conductors don't stay with one orchestra. They don't have that kind of control. They run around all over the world every, every season conducting, you know, everybody in sight with just a few rehearsals. They have to kind of get along with everybody. And if they don't, it doesn't matter because the orchestra could probably play the piece better without them. It makes it so much more difficult the circumstances today for a conductor to impose their will on a body of musicians over time to shape the orchestra in their own image and to create characterful and identifiable interpretations. Granted, it can happen. It does happen. It really does, but it doesn't happen as frequently as it used to. I don't think there's any question about that. I don't know if anyone's studied that phenomenon but it is, it, 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 I think it's a truth. I really do. I think the recordings bear this out. And that's one of the reasons why we still listen to Reiner's recordings. And so what I'm going to be doing once we're done with this little chat is over at ClassicsToday.com giving you my list of Fritz Reiner's 10 best recordings. This is for insider subscribers. And if you're not an insider subscriber, please feel free to go over to ClassicsToday.com and sign up. Or you can follow the link at the bottom of this video and sign up there. Now, Reiner came to Chicago from Pittsburgh, where he was, uh, I think, it, it also doing splendid work. He's, his work has been very well documented. You know, the Sony just released a box of his Pittsburgh stuff, which Jed Disler very, very thoroughly reviewed on ClassicsToday.com. Again, if you're an Insider member, have, have a look. Oh, my goodness. There goes my CDs. I always do that. Go have a look at that review um, because it's very, very interesting. He, re du he duplicated a lot of the same repertoire when he went to Chicago because that was the beginning of the stereo era. And Reiner, like Antal Dorati, for example, or Raphael Kubelik with Mercury Living Presence, happened to show up in Chicago at just the time that the stereo era was dawning. His first recording in Chicago was Strauss's Ein Heldenleben, a recording still widely regarded as the reference in that work. And rightly so, not just interpretively, but also sonically. It set a new standard for high fidelity. I mean, really, the sound on that thing is amazing. And that was only in 1954. So think about that. That, of course, just as the CD did when compact discs popped up, induced the industry to re-record everything so they could get it all down in stereo and then reissue it. I mean, it's a cyclical business. We see the same pattern over and over and over, although it seems to have been broken 
today with digital sound because those digits are still around and you can distribute people, them to people in all kinds of different ways, whether through streaming or physical product or whatever. But back then, back then it had to be physical product and there was a reason to redo the whole repertoire. So Ryder rode that wave and remade all of his repertoire in, wait a minute, I have it right here, this box, right there it is which is, I don't think, still available, which is terrible. It should be available forever. But anyway, here's the point. Here's the point. He was brutal. He was brutal. The most famous Reiner story probably is, and, and it's not the one where he comes out on top, is the one where, where uh, Bud Herseth, the famous, famous Chicago principal trumpet for a billion years, um, was doing Also Sprach Zarathustra. And in the the second part of Also Sprach's Arathustra, the trumpet has a solo, dum -ba -dum -ba, like that. And Reiner would single out musicians and make them play passages on pain of death if they screwed it up. And Herseth was so great. I mean, he was an unbelievable trumpeter, and he was just going, bum -ba -dum -ba, bum -ba -dum -ba. And he, you know, finally, he said to Reiner, how many times do you want me to do it? Just tell me. I could do it another hundred times, you know. And Reiner gave up. That was supposedly the apocryphal, maybe, but who knows, Reiner, Reiner tale of, you know, the musicians had bested him at his own game. And actually, that's something that happened as well. It's not just that conductors became less autocratic. Orchestral musicians became so much better than they were. And that's a really a major, major factor in our, our musical life today. The fact that these musicians are so good and they can basically do anything the conductor asks them to do or better than what the conductor asks them to do if they feel so inclined. You know, one of the last remaining conductor autocrats that I remember quite vividly from my own days was George Cleave. He was the conductor of the San Jose Symphony for quite a long time. And when I was in grad school in Stanford in the early 80s, he was there and he was famous for being a nut. I mean, for jumping up and down and carrying on and screaming. And it, I mean, he felt very passionately about the music, but he had a fairly uncontrolled temper. And as a result of that fairly uncontrolled temper, there is no question that it limited his career to those organizations that were willing to put up with him. I mean, because by then, you didn't have to put up with him. And so, and so they didn't, and they would in San Jose, where he gave some outstanding performances. But you can really understand how, you know, by then, musicians simply felt that it was, it was beneath them to deal with a maniac. I mean, Herbert von Karajan's career, remember, it ended, in the, it ended with the appointment of Sabina Meyer, the Berlin Philharmonic, the first lady member of the orchestra and uh, an excellent clarinetist. There was no question that she was qualified for the job, but the issue was not her qualifications. The issue was not even so much the fact that she was female, although a lot was made of that. The issue was who controls the orchestra. Carrion insisted that he had to. The orchestra said, no, no, no. <laughs> we decide who gets into the orchestra perhaps in collaboration with the conductor, but you're not going to go behind our back and do it. And because he did it, his relationship with that orchestra was basically poisoned, and, and it ended. It ended after all that time and all that money and all those records. But it was, it was a matter of principle to some degree. I mean, one of the reasons that American orchestras ceased to be recorded is because of the union contract that required, it was completely inflexible or very inflexible, and that required a certain uh, very, very high fee to make records. And classical recordings couldn't ever justify the fee because the, 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 the union scale was determined by pop music artists and freelancers, not by standing alone corporate orchestra type things. Now, of course, orchestras since have found ways to subsidize their work and get people to pay for recordings. And, you know, there's all kinds of creative financing things you can do. But by and large, at least in the USA, American orchestras don't care if they ever make records or not. 
They really don't. It's up to the conductor and the orchestra management to try and figure out ways to preserve what they're doing because, because the record labels no longer have the ability to do it. And more to the point, there aren't the conductors who are the face of the orchestra, who have long-term relationships with the orchestra, exclusive contracts with record labels, and who a record label would feel comfortable investing in. You know, Reiner was the face of Chicago. That was his orchestra, just like Zell was the face of Cleveland. And once they were gone, that whole era ended. And really, it was, it was a very, very striking time. And we're extremely lucky, very, very lucky, that these recordings have been preserved and that tell us what these people did. Because, you know, musical excellence is not a given, <laughs> let's put it that way. There's a certain technical level of excellence that today is a given, I think. I really do, but interpretive excellence, no way. You know it and I know it. And the circumstances that were available to conductors in those days, great musicians, many of them coming to the United States in exile, taking over extremely talented orchestras over which they had total authoritarian control that's never going to happen again. I mean, we see, we see sort of glimmers of it, but the glimmers of it are just perverse. One of them is, you know, Carensis and his crazy band in Siberia, you know, where he basically runs a cult and, and creates results which are indeed as sort of autocratically distinctive as some of the great conductors did, sort of sort of because it's not it's not quite the same but it's similar you can do it if you have the right circumstances but that's the that's the point isn't it it all depends on who's paying and how much they're paying and where they're paying and how much the musicians are willing to put up with the bullshit in order to get the job done and today they have a very low tolerance for that kind of bullshit and i think rightly so for the most part if they ever run into a genius, maybe they'll, they'll willingly submit to him or her or it or they. It's a possibility. It's a possibility. There's always a possibility. But in those days, it wasn't a possibility. It was standard practice. And because it was standard practice, we had marvelous, marvelous music making. And uh, bringing up the question of whether or not the ends justified the means. It's an unanswerable question, but it's hanging out there. It's hanging out there with all of these conductors. There were some musicians who adored them and who were highly respected as colleagues and collaborators in the musical enterprise and some whose careers were ruined and whose lives were, were horrible because of it. So, you know, I just hope that we keep this in mind when you go and have a look at the Fritz Reiner 10 best recordings because they are extraordinary recordings, amazing recordings, and definitely recordings that were created with more than the standard dose of blood, sweat, and tears. So keep on listening, friends. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care.